Contemporary Trends in Anthropology. So if you're following the lectures, we've been talking about right the historical context and its relationship to theory, method, and practice in anthropology. Through your study of anthropology here at EWU, you should have had a sense of the sort of the development of anthropology, change right in theories, change in, in methods, change in practice. Now we've been saying that this can't be sort of reduced just to the Im improvements right in the way we perceive and the way we reason about the world, that it that it, we have more to explain than perception and reason will allow. And so historical context allows us to kind of go beyond the classical model of individual anthropologists, right, thinking through these problems. The reality is that these developments really are better understood as related to historical context. We can understand how particular changes become urgent, why particular changes seem to be very important in particular moments. We can understand the form that they take and, and so on. So in the last lecture, we sort of looked at historical context in terms of Boaz. And since Boaz, that kind of critical form of anthropology that he, that he developed really professionalized in a way that didn't exist, right, at the time of Boaz. You have this kind of expansion. Uh, anthropology programs begin to be developed and can be found in a much larger range of universities than during the period of Bo Boaz. You have the post-depression New Deal, which created a lot of public projects for anthropological knowledge production. And then you have, after 1945, that huge period of U.S. economic growth, where there's a lot of uh, federal monies and other kinds of funding that get infused right into to anthropology and also allow for its its growth. So we see major changes right from from the Boazian, the kind of Boazian period. We see lots of new paradigms through time. The ideas like nation state and global system and so on uh, are developed right within anthropology. We have the women's and civil rights movements which make their impact on anthropology. And by the end of the 60s and into the 70s, with the begin beginnings of economic crisis in the United States and the contraction of the economy, we have that globalization. And in, in kind of tandem with globalization, we have the rise of, of neoliberalism. And unlike those previous trends that we just mentioned, with neoliberalism, here just the attack on the use of public funds. So once the economy begins to contract in the late 60s and into the 70s, when levels of corporate debt and so on begin to, to increase, the kinds of, let's say, New Deal funding and the kinds of funding that, are, that emerged from that post-war economic growth really begin to slow down. And we see that the resource base for anthropology uh, begins to be undermined. And at the same time, we see a lot of fragmentation. You've probably learned that even today we consider anthropology sort of theoretically to be post-paradynamic, that there are not like leading um, paradigms in which all anthropologists are, are either adopting and supporting and puzzle solving within or um, from outside, right, attacking that kind of paradigm. That kind of uh, really has seen a fracturing or a fragmentation really since the the 70s and then into the 80s. So contemporary anthropology, if you think about sort of where anthropology is today, if you think about a journal like the American Anthropologist, um, wh what do we see today? What, what today reflects the contemporary period, if you will? And you can see a lot of attention to things like global inequality, uh, since that period of time, we've seen an increase in global equality, inequality. And so this has been a, a big topic, right, for anthropologists. This isn't just something that we um, thought of, right, or that we just simply reason about, but it's something that's in the world that's kind of breaking through into anthropology and also affecting its growth and development. Black Lives Matter. We have the rise in nationalism and ultranationalism and political authoritarianism. 
we have large-scale environmental degradation and global climate change. And we have, within the context of this, we really do have faltering international institutions. We have the weakening of institutions like the United Nations. If we think about the kinds of method, practice, and application, much as you might imagine, incredibly pragmatic and, and diverse. We're in this post-paradynamic um, period of time, and you can really see that in the pragmatic and diverse approaches that anthropologists take. Critics are arguing, though, that without sort of a paradigm or a great debate, that it's really risking, right, the descent of anthropology really into a lot of noise, right? So a, a kind of uh, debate that doesn't push things forward can descend into just noise. It can have, you know, everybody's kind of developing their own paradigm, if you will, uh, and then thus dysfunction. And I think that the perception is that anthropology is in crisis today. And that is why for this kind of unit, I introduced this piece, Letting Anthropology Burn. So this is a, a, an article that was published in the American Anthropologist, and it sort of really encapsulates a lot of the, the issues that we've been talking about, about contemporary anthropology. And what the authors are arguing is that sort of anthropology, going back to its Boazian uh, basis, is sort of a, a really grounded in liberalism. It's, it's grounded in the idea of individual rights. And it presupposes a democratic system, and it presupposes a legal set of institutions to guarantee or protect those rights. And today, as we look at those range of problems, that the authors are making the argument, right, that anthropology, particularly with its liberal presuppositions, is not sufficient, right, to counter and to deal with these human existential threats, things like the climate catastrophe, right, and things like the authoritarian retrenchment, that a kind of liberalism and legal rights, if you will, uh, is, are simply not adequate to really deal with this. In this context, the kind of professionalization, expansion, bureau bureaucratization of anthropology has become sort of an obstacle to further, further de development. And so the authors are making this argument that we should let it burn. That as we, as we saw uh, there in California, when we had our uh, national meetings in a, a large hotel, Starbucks, other you know, corporate franchises, Marriott's and so on, uh, in California as the smoke from the forest fires is there kind of penetrating into the anthropology meeting, and anthropologists are getting on planes and they're flying to the meeting and they're standing with their Starbucks coffee, paper coffee. And the idea for these anthropologists that are involved with this, this article is that right, this is wholly in, inadequate. In fact, this is part of the problem. And they're specifically referring to anthropology. And the call to let it burn is that there can be something better that comes out of its wake that we need something more, more radical at this particular period of time. Uh, in fact, a colleague uh, worded it to me, is that we're gonna need a lot more than anthropology, right, to deal with these, these deep and widespread problems. And so they're arguing for a more radical humanism, we might call it post-humanism, that really reconceptualizes and redefines what it means to be a human on a much more kind of radical basis. So obviously when you're, you're listening to this, you're reading the article and so on, there is a very specific historical context and it has a, an economic basis to it. It has a complex set of social relations to it, right? And it has changing worldviews and philosophies. Uh, this, I think, is a, a perfect example of trying to illustrate the way that these particular contexts, right, are really crucial in understanding the change in anthropological thought practice through time. So what are we doing here in this lecture? We are talking a little bit about contemporary anthropology, right, the models, the paradigms, the ways of thinking that are, are dominant at this present moment, and really considering one particular article that has had a, a great deal of influence. A lot of people are talking about it, this idea of letting it burn. 
we're probably the only discipline where we have practitioners, right, who are advocating the destruction of their own own discipline. So it's really notable, and that's why people have have really talked about it. I think it does say something not only about anthropology, but it says something about this historical moment. As your BA, if you think back to these learning outcomes that we're looking at, one of the th one of the things that we believe every uh, anthropology major getting a degree should be able to 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 talk about to understand is sort of trends in anthropological thought and their relationship to history. And so, kind of modeling this, but then asking you to think with historical context and apply it to the things you've studied, the things that you've researched, and the things that you anthropologically think.